was like, guy, that sucked. You are a terrible singer. You're not allowed to sing anymore. I'm like, thank you. Of course. I already knew that. So um, I don't sing. So I can't entertain you with song. I can dance, but I'm not going to do it. Um, this is actually kind of a verbal dance while I wait for Mike and Skyler to see if they're ready. Are you ready? All right. This is Mike and Skyler. They're going to talk about uh, direction finding foo, uh, uh, which I'm actually really excited about because I've done a lot of half-assed direction finding work in my life. Um, but uh, if anything, Mike does not do anything half-assed. That's been my one takeaway from watching him in his career. Not to put too much pressure on him. Um, so anyway, with that, I'm happy to have you guys be the uh, uh, kickoff uh, talk today. So have a good one. Yay, this is the part where you clap, as Jeb Bush would say. Thank you, Bruce. I'm Michael Osman. I'm Skylar St. Ledger. Today we're going to talk to you about our research on doing pseudo-Doppler direction finding. I'd like to start out by thanking these people. Uh, Balance Siever has done a lot of work with pseudo-Doppler direction finding on the USERP. Uh, Jonathan Corgan for talking to us about his work on this and more advanced techniques. Dominic Smill, who wrote a lot of the software that we've worked on. Yeah, and uh, Jacob and Taylor, who helped us design and construct some of our test jigs. So, um, pseudo-Doppler direction finding is based off of a technique called Doppler direction finding, which uses the principle of the Doppler shift, which is where if, you're in, if your antenna is moving closer to a transmitter, the frequency will appear higher, and if you're moving away from a transmitter, the frequency will appear lower. With Doppler direction finding, what we do is we move an antenna in a circle very rapidly, so it's always moving towards or away from a transmitter. So that means that we'll have a frequency tone that's constantly varying, similar to an FM modulated tone. By measuring the phase of that tone, so like where in time it goes up and down in frequency, we can then determine the uh, bearing that the transmitter is relative to us. So the problem with Doppler direction finding, though, is that you have to move your antenna very quickly, uh, on the order of thousands of rotations per second, which with a mechanical system is pretty much impossible. So what we do instead is we have an array of four or sometimes eight antennas, and you switch between them rapidly to simulate the one antenna moving very quickly. So for this project, we're using uh, software-defined radio platform, HackRF1, I like it because I designed it, and uh, we like it for this project because it's open source hardware and software, and we can hack on it. And it, um, it also is based on this LPC 4300 microcontroller. That's the big chip on the right that kind of runs the show. Left. And, and um, well, it's their right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, Skylar will talk a little bit about uh, the firmware that he's developed that takes advantage of some of the features of that chip. That's important to us. Um, now, also for this project and for some other projects, I designed this add-on board. Uh, this prototype is called Opera Cake. That's just its code name. Um, and it's an add-on board that plugs into HackerF1, and it's an antenna switching uh, module. And so basically on the right-hand side, you have one primary antenna port that can be switched to four secondary ports. So it's a one to four switch. And then on the left, you also have another one to four switch. And there's also a crossover capability, so you can use it as a one to eight if you want. We're just using it as a one to four and using four antenna arrays today, but we can use this hardware to go up to eight antennas if we want to. And it's plugged, it plugs right into the Hacker F1, which means that it's controlled directly by the microcontroller on the Hacker F1. And that gives us some interesting capabilities uh, to have tightly synchronized antenna switching with operations of the software-defined radio receiver. One of the other things that's important is for your antenna array to where the switches all come together is all the traces and cables should be the same length. So the Opera Cake was designed to have everything be length matched on it and then for connecting to the antenna array, all the cables are the same length as well. Right. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about phase of radio signals, and so by having the same cable length from the radio receiver all the way to each antenna, uh, we kind of eliminate that phase difference that might happen uh, from just having different cable lengths. So the LPC 4300 series microcontroller has some amazing peripherals that can be connected together in amazing ways. 
On it, the, in the normal HackRF firmware, there's a peripheral called the SDPIO, which is responsible for reading samples from the ADC into the microcontroller. We care about it because it has access to the sample clock. We configure one of its unused pins to output the sample clock internally, then route it through a multiplexer array, that's GEMA, to the SC timer or state configurable timer, and that then drives the, uh, sw the switches on the opera cake to cycle through the antennas. For us, it's important that the sample clock is what is where the switching timing is derived from, because that means we don't have to deal with a separate synchronization system, and we can always know how long each antenna is going to be selected for and when we're going to the next one. It, it takes away a lot of the complexity. And due to the architecture, it's actually really easy to do. The other nice thing about the SC timer and everything else that we are using is it's all hardware peripherals in the microcontroller. So they're configured with software, but there's no software responsible for doing the switching, so you don't have any interrupt latency or CPU problems like that. Then on the host side, it becomes an issue of processing that tone that the pseudo-Doppler uh, switching generates. To do that, we just do an FMD mod and then measure the phase. And that gives us the bearing of the transmitter. So there were some interesting challenges when doing pseudo-Doppler direction finding of kind of modern radio systems that are um, more sophisticated modulations or shorter packet lengths. Um, the, all of the, the work that we've seen in the past, like older pseudo-Doppler techniques, primarily we've seen pseudo-Doppler used in like the amateur radio community or people who are looking at high-powered constant transmitters uh, like aviation radios, for example. And we were interested to know if we could make this approach work for kind of modern, lower power, bursty, uh, higher data rate kinds of technologies like like home automation systems, industrial control systems, Internet of Things, all that kind of garbage, and um, and so we have certain challenges that we had to kind of figure out, and one of them was just dealing with lo with very short packets, and that's kind of similar to dealing with very short packets in SDR in general. We just have to have some kind of packet detection. Um, but then we, what's critical is that you, you don't use like a squelch technique or something that is dropping samples on the floor. Uh, because if you drop samples on the floor, then you'll typically uh, lose your phase reference. And we need to maintain an absolute phase reference. So as long as your packet detection method maintains uh, a consistent phase, uh, you'll be OK. But there's this problem where we've talked about how the, the, uh, the rotation of the antenna sort of produces an FM. Uh, a frequency modulation tone. Um, it's not so much producing a tone as producing a modulation. Like it, it's it's actually modulating the sig the radio signal, and this is a radio signal that's carrying data, so it's already modulated. We're modulating it again, and there's a potential that the data modulation interferes with our rotation modulation, or the rotation modulation interferes with the data modulation. So here's an example of an FSK packet, frequency shift keying packet. Uh, this is a short packet, about two milliseconds long. Uh, it has a bandwidth of about 150 kilohertz. And in these spectrograms, the vertical axis is frequency and the horizontal axis is time. And on the right-hand side, you see what the packet looks like if you receive it with, a radio, with an SDR uh, receiver with a single antenna, no rotation happening. So that's a good packet that we can decode. But in the middle, you can see we're rotating our antenna array at a rate of 20,000 rotations per second. And the modulation becomes very difficult to see because basically we're creating a whole bunch of images that overlap on top of each other. And so our, our data modulation interferes with our rotation modulation in such a way that we have a hard time decoding or deciding what direction that signal is coming from. And vice versa, the rotation modulation interferes with the data modulation, and so we have a hard time decoding the data. We can't really get either one. But we figured out that it really turns out to be pretty easy. All we have to do is rotate a whole lot faster. Um, and so on the right-hand side, we're rotating at 312,000 uh, rotations per second. This is, we're you know, up above a million RPM here. And um, if you're spinning around that fast, 
then the images produced by the rotation end up separated apart from each other by 312 kilohertz, by the way. Each one of those images is 312 kilohertz apart from the next one. And so what we have is um, each individual image is not clobbering another image. And we're able to decode data from the transmission and decode the direction from the transmission both from the same capture point. And there are actually people have, for especially like amateur radio fox hunts, designed their transmitters such that they transmit specifically where a lot of common pseudo-Doppler direction finding systems use as a rotation frequency, which means that you can't use those. Yeah, people have deliberately jammed or uh, uh, pseudo-Doppler receivers to try to prevent them from detecting a direction. People have also tried to spoof uh, pseudo-Doppler receivers to prevent them from determining a direction. One way we have to deal with that is by just using a very high rotation rate uh, that would be harder to spoof, or just by using an unpredictable rotation rate, um, which we can configure on the fly. Uh, so we're going to do a little demonstration here, and we'll see how this goes. Um, this will be fun. Um, so, uh, uh, Skylar has a wireless microphone. Please don't recall us. We, we developed this uh, demo kind of in the last 20 minutes. Um, Here's our antenna array, and then it's going to the opera cake on the hack RF here, and that's going to the computer where the processing happens. And uh, what's going on here? Uh, Am I you, plugged into the hack RF? You, you oh, you, I'm not rotating my antennas. Duh. You are not. I thought I was, but maybe it got reset. No, device it, not found. Now it's reset. We're connected. Device not found. It's plugged in and that's the default state. All right. Let's try a new USB cable. Do you have you? Do you have another one over there? This one hanging in my bag, right? Here. Yes. We've totally done this before. <laughs> it worked last time, we promise. Ah, was able to configure the hacker app. Was the flow graph running last time? Uh, I don't think so. There we go. Okay. Now, over here in this crazy spectrogram, um, you're seeing a whole bunch of different images of the wireless microphone. Hello. Any one of those is, in fact, uh, really the original signal. The other images are being created. But all those all those extra images are being created by our antenna rotation. But and the other thing also is that these images are of anything in that spectrum. So if there's say another tra high transmitter of moderate power that's in as close enough or in your same bandwidth, it can cause problems because you'll get the images from that and the images that you want, and that can cause issues. Okay. Go for a walk, Skylar. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, what you're seeing here in the left-hand side of the screen is supposed to be indicating the direction of the microphone. It's not working particularly well, but do you notice how sometimes all those blue dots are kind of grouped together in a certain place? This is supposed to be a polar uh, coordinate graph, and, um, and when you see all those blue dots grouped together in a certain place, it's, the, the flow graph is trying to tell us that's the direction that the uh, microphone is in. Now, you might notice that uh, sometimes we get sort of a consistent direction, but it tends to jump around a whole lot. Um, and there are some potential explanations for that. Um, we've had, I'll show you another. Uh, and the distance from the power, or the distance from the center corresponds to the power? Oh yeah, and that's just a little hack that I did to uh, make it a little easier to visualize, especially for uh, inconsistent transmissions. Like if the transmission is coming and going, um, we're indicating the direction by the the angle uh, of the uh, on the polar coordinate system, but then we're just taking the original amplitude and scaling our output on our plot here by the original amplitude. So so when you see a bunch of dots that are really close to the center, really close to the origin, that probably just means there's no signal present, and then when there's a dot that's further away from the origin that is a signal present. Let me show you a slightly better um, result here that is uh, a demo using a 
uh, a device that we captured last night. Um, and so this is a, a packet-based system that transmits one packet per second. And it uses FSK, frequency shift keying. This is actually the same system that I had the screenshots of earlier. So, the, so you can see those bursts that happen once per second. Every time there's a burst, that's uh, two packets of about two milliseconds long. And if I look at my um, plot here, you can see I'm getting, uh, it's actually repeating through this. So from time to time, it just like jumps to the opposite, jumps to some random uh, phase because we don't have any direction calibration. But then you'll see a few different packets that move. Uh, some, and it, it starts out at one place, and then I move the thing uh, a little more than 90 degrees. And you can see that the direction has actually changed. Now, uh, in general, our, our, our demos don't work quite as well as we would hope they would. Um, we can definitely get direction information sometimes. That's pretty reliable. Um, but we've run into this problem, and this problem is multipath. Every time there's a radio signal produced by a transmitter, it radiates in a lot of different directions at once. And there may be some of the radio signal that gets, goes directly to the receiver, and some bounces off a wall, and some bounces off another wall, and different paths take different amounts of time to get to the receiver, and so different, they have different phases when they get there because they've gone uh, you know, a different distance. And so the, uh, the end result is that the phase that we're measuring is somewhat unpredictable based on multipath reflections and how those different paths constructively or destructively interfere with one another. And we're like, is this really our problem? Why are some of these weird effects happening? Um, and we thought, well, it might be multipath. And so to find out if it is, in fact, multipath, uh, I made a simulator. And so I have a simulator here, which uh, involves things like this chunk of blocks, which is simulating the phase shift of four different antennas, for a, uh, or rotating through four antennas for a given path. And then I have a second path and then I have a third path, so I can change the characteristics of three different paths, and I can run a signal source through it, or I can run a capture file through it, and I can simulate and try to figure out if multipath is, in fact, the problem for us. And so I have here now, do you see this big peak on the right? What I'm run doing is I'm just running a constant sine wave into it as my source. And these sidebands, these other peaks, are actually being produced by my simulated antenna rotation. And you can see in my plot here now um, that I have a fairly con a, a consistent direction. And if I move this angle slider, this angle slider represents the direction of the source radio signal to my receiver, my virtual receiver. And you can see as I move the slider around, in fact, that blue dot moves around, as I'd expect. But if I were to uh, add in another multipath signal with pretty high power, and now when I move my first, my primary signal around, I move it around and it kind of moves, but maybe not at the same rate that it used to, and every now and then I run into something funky like this, and it jumps to the other side. Yeah. And so, this is usually when they're uh, 180 degrees apart. Yeah, and so now you add more multiple paths and you get even worse effects. And so this is a problem that we're trying to deal with now, trying to find creative ways to, to kind of solve the multipath problem. It's definitely something that people who've done pseudo-Doppler before have run into, and people have said things like, well, you have to take a lot of measurements from a lot of different locations and then aggregate their information to deduce the, the location of a system. And yes, that is a short answer, but hopefully we can find some even better ways to deal with multipath in the future, and hopefully the simulator will help us test our ideas more rapidly. Uh, how are we doing on time? All right, we're about almost out of time. So our ideas for the future include using uh, phase demodulation instead of frequency, and what that should let us do is to differentiate between the multiple reflections and different signals coming in, even if they're on the same frequency that, that they're transmitting on, so that we can try and avoid this issue with multipath. We're also considering having an asymmetric antenna array. Instead of having, like we have here, four antennas that are all the same, equal distance from each other, having one antenna that's spaced differently, and that way we could uh, make it where we can calibrate where is north, or like our origin for the heading, without needing to like 
set, turn on a transmitter and do that. We are also looking at doing pseudo-random antenna switching. So instead of just doing an order, you have a pseudo-random sequence that you switch between the antennas in. And what that means is that if there's, say, modulation at your ro rotation frequency, that modulation, because it's not the same pseudo-random sequence, will get spread out like direct sequence spread spectrum, whereas your antenna rotation frequency, when you undo the pseudo-randomness, will get amplified as one signal. Yeah, and, and one of the benefits that we hope to get from doing pseudo-random antenna switching is kind of the ultimate in preventing, uh, or the ultimate countermeasure against people trying to spoof or jam our direction finding technique. And we think that'll be a really cool result. Um, and uh, all, another thing that we're, we uh, should be doing but aren't yet is uh, related to the calibration issue, like calibrating an absolute starting direction or something. Um, we could be just tagging the samples that come from the HackRF and, tell, and having in our sample stream information that tells us exactly which antenna was used in exactly which sample. Uh, since we have sample synchronous antenna switching, thanks to the firmware that Skyler wrote, uh, we should be able to do that and that should be uh, another tool in our toolbox for just eliminating the need to uh, calibrate some arbitrary phase reference every time or direction reference every time we uh, turn up, turn on the thing. Here is where our result, our code is posted. The first link, the pseudo Doppler repository on GitHub, will have these examples and will hopefully have documentation for how to use the code. That'll exist real soon now. <laughs> I'm going to post the uh, flow graphs we used today on that repo. The second one is the actual firmware that runs on the HackRF with the changes to do the antenna switching. It all, that all works, but is currently the, hopefully you know how to use it because there's no documentation. <laughs> And the, uh, the last link is the main repo for the HackRF project. Uh, that's where this code will ultimately end up as we refine it a bit. And it's also where all the hardware designs and the firmware are that we're using, including the Opera Cake add-on board. Uh, it's all open source hardware, so you can build your own board if you want. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. I don't know. Is, is anyone kicking us off the stage, or should we have? Do we have time for a question? Or sure. yeah, questions. Bruce says sure. Any questions? Go ahead. Oops. Is, is it sensitive to frequency? Is it? Sen can you elaborate? Is it sensitive to the rotation frequency? You mean? No. Oh, the 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 RF, the actual. Uh, so the the size of your array and the size of your antenna is proportional, should be proportional to your frequency. Actually, one of the things we've learned from our simulator is that this, it's, this solution is not as sensitive to like the distance between antennas as people in the past have seemed to claim. Uh, in general, th there's kind of a limit where, where if the antennas get about a half wavelength apart from each other or more, uh, all hell breaks loose. But as long as they're kind of within a half wavelength apart from each other and, or less, uh, there's no real, uh, there's no great, no, no particular sweet spot in size of the array. Uh, but it does have to be like no more than half the wavelength um, or else we run into problems. Um, and the, uh, but other than that, so that's the biggest sensitivity we have to the actual frequency. Otherwise, we can use any frequency in the range of our software-defined radio receiver. So why would we need to build if I wanted to do 300 megahertz and then 2.4 gig, I'd need two different arrays? You would probably want to have two different arrays to do both 300 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah, because they're an order of magnitude apart in size or in wavelength. And so you'd want a, a bigger array for those lower frequency. Thank you. Okay, thanks.